Yeah, might as well start this thing. Here you go. How are you? Professor Rice here for you. Today we're going to talk about uh, something that's uh, pretty important to recording these days. And in fact, we can use this sort of signal all day long and never really touch actual audio recording until the final product. Of course, you know I'm talking about it. Or, as we like to call it, musical instrument digital interface. Or the Revenge of the Player Piano. I guess it's one of the kind of the fun things about being of a certain age is that I've lived through a couple of changes in my life with music. One of them, uh, my grandfather uh, had a player piano back in the day, which was kind of cool because a player piano, for those of you who don't really know what that means, is that you have a piano and then you have this vacuum system where you can start pumping on the bottom of the piano and sort of pump a bellows. And that creates a vacuum. And then there's this sort of a bar with little holes in it. And each one of those holes represents a note that's, it's each of those ports out to a, a different note on the piano. The pump action as you're doing this to make the, the, the thing for the bellows also causes the musical roll to go around. The musical roll has little holes in it that go over the holes that correspond to the keys. And that's how you get a player to piano. And you can just sit there all day and pump, 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 and look at it, blink, 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 and your piano's playing. That's the original sequencer. So I was there. I, I got to hear the very first one. Go me. Um, but then I, I was also around for the beginning of MIDI. I, I was just fresh out of school, not too much older than you guys. Uh, and the first thing I did was buy a synthesizer. It did not have MIDI, but the one that came right after it did. And MIDI was something that we didn't really see coming necessarily. But it was some. It was the, the the brainchild of some people that realized that you know why not make it so that all synthesizers and all electronic music devices have the capability to communicate with each other, uh, one way or another, and allow you to, to use them in multiple forms. Once synthesizers and, and really MIDI did come from the from the need from synthesizers. It was from synthesizer companies and people with synthesizer companies that started this whole idea of even having this I, this thing happen. Back in the good old days, I mean, the synthesizers was a wild, wild west time. It was crazy out there, y'all. Um, all these different companies, you had Moog, you had Oberheim in the, in the States, you had a Krumar, you had all these co cool different companies that were doing all kinds of neat little different keyboards. You had Japan was doing all kinds of different stuff. They were creating, there was Roland, there was Yamaha, there was Kawaii. There were all these different companies in Japan that were um, sort of taking... FM synthesis mostly, which is something invented in America, and running with it. So as a result of this, we have all these different proprietary, different kinds of, of synthesizers, and, and they can't talk to each other. You can't plug a line from one of them into the other one. You can't get from um, one of these Oberheims to the Moog and the Moog to the Oberheim. You can't do it. They just won't do that. So they're, they're proprietary. They're islands unto themselves. So synthesizer companies were trying to figure it out, and they were just barely getting around to polyphonic, for instance, in the late 70s. Uh, they're just getting to the point where you could play a chord on a synthesizer and not just a single note at the time. You could actually play a nice, you know, pretty chord. So we get to this point in the, in the late 70s, and we get some folks, uh, and particularly this gentleman by the name of Ikutaro Kakahashi, and he was Roland. And here's a here's kind of a great shot right here. This photo is a is this is basically some synthesizer, the big daddies of synthesis right here. You got Dave Smith on the left who did sequential circuits, uh, Robert Moog who of course the Moog synthesizer you've probably heard of, then Ikotaro Kakahashi, who was the Roland guy, and then Tom Oberheim who was the uh, the American synthesis that that designed the really the first polyphonic synthesizers. And Oberheim synthesizers, when I was a young man in the, in the late 70s, those were the ones you wanted. The Oberheims were the bees, freaking knees, man. They were sounding so good, so thick. And you could make these. You could also pre-program your patches with those. And that wasn't something you could do with a lot of synthesizers then. Kakahashi, he's, he's got this idea that, you know, we, this whole proprietary situation with, with synthesizers is hurting the industry. I mean, if we can make it so that people could, you know, collect different kinds of synthesizers and buy a bunch of them and they could all talk to each other. This was good for the industry. We could do more stuff with this. We got together with Oberheim and Dave Smith. Roland had already worked out a, a pretty cool um, sort of way of making things control each other in their environment. 
you know, he, he talked to these guys. They took it and ran with it. Dave Smith went back to the American guys, and nobody was really biting on it. The only people that ended up really wanting to pursue this going forward, not even Oberheim did it, were all the Japanese guys and Dave Smith with certain sequential circuits. So go figure. Actually, hey, let me move this thing here because you don't want to see this. Now you want to see that. So, yeah, now we're talking about 81 or so. So this guy Chet Wood gets gets together uh, and get, grabs the Roland digital control bus with the DCB, puts that together with some ideas that he has, and they come up with a paper for AES, which is the Audio Engineering Society, which is pretty much where everything gets developed in, in audio, and does a paper in October 81. Uh, Kakahashi wants to call this the, uh, Yumi, U-M-I, Yumi for Universal Musical Interface, and Dave Smith says, dude, no, really? You, you sure about that? I don't think so. Uh, then Bob Moog sort of blabbed about it in this here version of um, of Keyboard Magazine. And it's kind of funny you see that you see Toto on the cover. You don't see anything about MIDI, which is like, which was more important to music, Toto or MIDI? You tell me. I'm not going to make that kind of judgment call. I'm, that's not my scene. Things start picking up in 1982. Roland starts putting the MIDI into their Jupiter 6s. Sequential Circuit starts putting them into their Prophet 600s. Uh, we have new NEC um, computers being made, the PC-88, PC-98. They put MIDI ports in these things. So we're getting around to the point where it finally makes its big debut. And the big debut happens at the NAM show, uh, at the Winter NAM show in 1983. They basically, what they do is they take some MIDI chords and they connect the Prophet 600 and a Roland JP-86, two different companies, two different countries, and they make it so they can one of them can play the other, and the and then the, the one other one plays the other one, and everybody at the Nam show freaked out because it was like, wow, that's a great idea. Who? Why didn't we do this sooner? This is great. We can have now that means we can have, you know, keyboards can collect a bunch of these different keyboards, and then you can stack them all together and make these outrageous sounds. It could be freaking great. So and then on top of that, they're going, well, why not drum machines? We'll make drum machines so they're MIDI fiable. Uh, that's cool. So the TR-909, which I owned. And then the MSQ-700 sequencer, which was a little box about yay big, about the size of a small toaster. And it took floppy disks. And yeah, floppy disks. No floppy disk joke, sorry. Uh, floppy disks. And basically it had four tracks of sequencing and it sequenced pretty much 32 uh pulses per quarter note which means there were 32 breakdowns between every quarter note beats so you didn't get a lot of resolution in other words you couldn't do any real time it was all going to lock into a sequence but hey they were pretty cool i could do four tracks of sequences i could have different se different devices going from each track of those and have a great time making all kinds of noise which i did i was happy to do that um yeah midi it was a beautiful thing uh, 1984 comes along, and all of a sudden we're getting sound cards built into PCs. The MPU-401 uh, gets put into PCs. Uh, Apple and Atari, both of these companies start developing a lot of software, uh, realizing they can use MIDI, um, and they actually get the they get the leg up on the PC companies. The PC companies were a little behind that, and that which is why a lot of times you hear about you know folks, uh, artists, and musicians preferring apples uh, because they were sort of a little bit ahead of the curve with all that. We haven't really talked about what, I mean, what, what is MIDI? What is it? I mean, yeah, we were able to put two keyboards and connect them together. We got one to play the other and one, the other one to play the other one. Who gives a crap other than that? I mean, what, I mean, what is it, what's going between these things that makes this thing happen? What's the substance of MIDI? Well, I'm glad you asked because I know you were going to ask. So let's talk about that for a second here. MIDI is basically, it's a set of messages. A set of messages that can be sent from a MIDI controlling device to a MIDI instrument device. The MIDI controller has ways of controlling the MIDI, the uh, MIDI information like note on and note off, which are the basic ones. You know, play this note, don't play this note. Um, so that's a, ba that's a that would be a basic message, for instance. Uh, we want to have a controller be able to send that to an instrument. Just to sort of clarify what that means, a MIDI controller a device that sends a MIDI out to MIDI devices. Uh, so it would mean like a keyboard is a MIDI controller. Uh, a sequencer, like my sequencer, is a MIDI controller because it's sending out MIDI, which goes to a device which then makes noise. A triggering device will also be a MIDI controller. 
Uh, then we have a MIDI instrument. MIDI instruments are devices that receive this MIDI from the controller and then output some audio. So we're talking about a sound module that takes MIDI information out and outputs audio information, or VST, AAX, anything that's inside of your computer that, that's your um, soft synthesizer. That would be a MIDI instrument. So keyboard plays, you know, is the controller plays the instrument, which is the, the VST. Of course, we have MIDI hybrids, and MIDI hybrid would be just like these keyboards that they had at the NAMM show, these, which had both the keyboard on it and the sound module. And the keyboard on board played the sound module on board. But you could make the keyboard of one a keyboard play the sound module of the other keyboard, and that keyboard, that synthesizer's keyboard, play the sound module of this other keyboard. So anyways, that's what was the whole point was we were separating the keyboard or controller from the instrument, the MIDI instrument. Um, although, yes, of course, we still have lots of MIDI hybrids, synthesizers, workstations, those, can, those would be it. So, so here's the thing about MIDI. We send these messages, these, these note on, note off messages and some other messages we'll talk about in a second. These messages get sent over a total of 16 channels. So th what that means is you can have 16 different MIDI instruments, MIDI modules playing simultaneously, or, or MIDI instruments. Obviously, there's lots of options. I mean, 16 channels of MIDI. That's, that's, we've been doing pretty good with 16 channels of MIDI for a long time. I want to make a quick mention about this notion of MIDI modes. Basically, two states that we need to talk about. Um, in the beginning, when MIDI, when MIDI was first created, there was this idea that we needed to have this, uh, this this setting called Omni. When your MIDI instrument is in Omni mode, it will receive all MIDI channels. So if you got your MIDI controller, uh, different sequencers are sending out stuff on channel one, two, three, four, and five to different things, your instrument in Omni will pick up all of them, all all the information on all channels, all at the same time. Whoa. Now, why would you want to do that? I'm not really sure. I can't really answer that. Um, but in their infinite wisdom, in the beginning of MIDI, they thought, well, people might need to know that. You know, what if we wanted? Hey, what if somebody wants to take um, the stuff that they've done on all these different MIDI channels and then hear them all on the piano at the same time, rather than send them all to channel one? Let's just put the piano in Omni and we can hear it all. Uh, that's the only thing I can imagine. But, anyways, we have four MIDI modes: Omni on, polyphonic, which means it, it'll play more than one note. Omni on monophonic, and then omni off polyphonic and omni off monophonic. The only things that we need to really concern ourselves with is that we can have a setting called omni on, which is uh, available on some synthesizers. I don't know if you'll ever need it, but for the most part, we are always, always on omni off poly, so that we can have multiple notes in MIDI being played, but have specific channels. However. You may hear every now and then about the four modes. That's really the, that's what we're referring to, the MIDI modes. So anyways, enough about that. Let's talk about how this uh, MIDI stuff gets transmitted. Uh, MIDI transmission, I mean, and I'm still talking a little bit historical here because we're still talking about MIDI 1.0. This is the MIDI that we started with and we've had now for God knows how long now. Uh, we have MIDI 2.0, which I'm going to talk a little bit about here in a minute, although this is probably going to be the way go by the wayside very soon this particular style of transmission uh it behooves me for me to inform you about it so midi transmissions okay let's talk about what is it what is it midi transmissions are a binary language uh it's as, and up until recently it's been a serial transmission in a unidirectional circuit and what that means is uh, you get one bit at a time in the in the in the cable. One, it's like a train of bits. It's not packets. The orig original MIDI is not packets. MIDI 2.0 is, but 1.0 is not. It's a unidirectional circuit, so that means it's going in one direction, one bit at a time. It's transmitted in a, in a closed circuit. So you start with a, uh, and basically it's a five volt source through a 200 ohm. Uh, resistance 5 milliamp circuit which basically it's a complete circuit when you plug your MIDI cord into from one device to another the information is going out on pin 4 and the, the circuit return is pin 5 and then there's a, there's a shield on pin 2 1 and 2 pins are not used on MIDI cables and apparently never will be now because we've moved past this MIDI cable this DIN cable a 5 pin DIN cable <clears throat> which is a twisted pair, 
but yes, basically, and also the MIDI out port is grounded. That's the only, and that's sort of how the, the system gets grounded. You don't have it on ground on both ends. Uh, some other fun facts about MIDI transmission is that the bit stream goes at 31.25 kilobytes, which means 31,250 bits per second, which is slow. Very, very slow. But we're talking about 1.0. This was made in 1983. Okay, so bear with these poor guys here. It's slow. Um, Because nowadays we're putting it through Ethernet, USB, and FireWire, and it's flying through it. But back in the day, it was slow. So what that meant, just to sort of stick with the the historical situation here, you'll notice there's three kinds of ports. And these ports are basic. It's pretty straightforward. The MIDI import obviously accepts the MIDI messages and then sends it to where it needs to go in the synthesizer or the device, just, you know, that, but that's where it comes in. MIDI out from a device means that that device, controller device, is the master controller. It's going to be the originator of MIDI data in the system. So this is not a pat. You can't do a pass-through with a MIDI out. You have to use MIDI through. And MIDI through, what that port does, is basically that's an exact copy of whatever's coming into MIDI in. It just sort of blops it right on over to the MIDI through port so that it can go on to the next device. Uh, so, yes, you can daisy chain these devices. You can make it so you have your MIDI controller and then goes through one module and then daisy chains to another module and daisy chains to another module and so on and so on and so on. And what will happen is at the end, by the time you get to like the third uh, of these modules, you're going to have latency. That thing's going to start getting noticeably late <clears throat> and you're going to be bummed out and not into it. So what you want to do is do a star hub topography. When you're doing this kind of old school MIDI, you need to get a MIDI interface or splitter, <clears throat> or a, a MIDI, um, yeah, a MIDI what we call MIDI through box, which can give you multiple MIDI outputs. So you go one input, four out, and star hub your arrangement, and that minimizes latency. But that's only if you're really dealing with old school stuff. If you have to do sort of any kind of setup with MIDI and old school porting, that's what's got to happen. And I hope you get to do that sometime because you know they're fun to play with. But I realize your MIDI experience will be different than mine because your MIDI experience is coming from the, the future of MIDI and mine it comes from the past of it. So uh, let's move on from this then and let's talk about what's, what, what are we sending? What, so we know it's, it's a bit stream. We know it's, it's basically serial bit stream. Up until now, unidirectional. Now it's bidirectional. Uh, it's basically ones and zeros. It's all ones and zeros. But what do the ones and zeros represent and how do they represent them? Uh, that's a good question. I was going to ask myself that as well. We get a bit stream of ones and zeros coming through serial transmission, unidirectional. Uh, they then are decoded into eight bit groups or bytes. So if you guys know about bytes, if you haven't heard of a byte, B Y T E, that is eight bits. So we can sort of chop our, our buddies up into eight bits. And um, so that's what our messages are, basically. And, and most of these MIDI messages will consist of at least two bytes. And these two bytes will be at least uh, a, one a status byte and a data byte. Now, a lot of times your MIDI messages will have three bytes, which means we, we'll have, but you always have one status byte and at least one data byte, maybe another data byte. And there's other, there's some messages that require a couple more data bytes and even a bunch more data bytes. But for the most part, two to three bytes in total, two bytes, one or two bytes for data bytes. Our status bytes come first. They start with a one. And then the rest of the byte, the rest of the ones and zeros, the other seven of them designate uh, what kind of message is being sent and on what MIDI channel we're sending it because we have 16 channels to choose from. Our data bytes, they start with a zero, and then the rest of that byte uh, basically indicates the, the value of the parameter that's going to be de- uh, determined by the status byte. How does this work? Um, uh, let's see. Let's look at it. So here's a sample of a sampled MIDI message, and I did a little chopping it up. I went and put some little hash marks in the MISP. You'll see three sets of eight bits like this for a sampled MIDI message like this, and this MIDI message is a note on message. So what does this message tell us with these three, three bytes? Okay, the first byte is over there on the left. It starts with a one, so that means it's the status byte, the first byte. Most significant bit is a one. So then the next three bytes, bits two, oh, bytes, I'm saying bytes, it should be bits. The next three bits, two, three, and four, 
those designate the MIDI message type. So we have three bits, and three bits give us eight possible states. And those eight possible states are as follows. Note on, note off, polyphonic pressure, control change, program change, channel pressure, pitch bend, and system. Okay, so what, is the, what do these mean? I'm going to get into this a little bit. But, um, but uh, polyphonic pressure and channel pressure are referred to aftertouch. We're going to get into that. Control change is a whole world unto itself. That's pretty much the catch-all thing. I'm going to explain this in a minute. Anyways, then the next four bits, five bits, five, six, and seven, and eight, in the status byte designate the MIDI channel. So in this case, we have four zeros. Four zeros, obviously that number is zero. But we don't have a channel zero, although it wouldn't be cool if we had a channel zero. We should have a channel zero. I'm going to talk about someone about having a channel zero. We don't have a channel zero. We need to have a channel one. So when it says zero, when the number says zero, we then add a one to it in this channel one. So therefore, for instance, if it was all ones, one, 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 that number would, uh, that number, one, 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 one represents number 15. We would add one to that and that would be channel 16. So we take whatever's presented there in the status byte and we then add one. So this status byte right here says we have a note on message because zero, zero, one basically, uh, the, the notes a, a note on message and it's on MIDI channel one because zero 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 connotes that it's going to be MIDI channel one so that's what the first byte tells us the status byte says note on message MIDI channel one standby so we'll check out to see what the next message says so then we have two data bytes that follow that the first data byte in this situation it uh, denotes the note number so what note number it, what notes on what note on the keyboard is on? Is it, you know, C? Is it F? G? What's the note? So note, but of course in MIDI, we don't go like A, C sharp. We say we have to give specific numbers to specific notes. So we go up and down the piano and we give them all numbers. The first bit basically tells us that it's a data byte. So we don't get to use that. We have, that leaves us seven bits. Seven bits then tells us what we want to tell. That gives us 128 states, 128 states. So we have 128 um, possible notes on the piano. A piano has 88 notes. So we give it another 20 notes on either side. We got this. We can get any note we can possibly hear in 128 notes. The first data byte uh, denotes the note on message. The second data byte, the first bit says, I'm a data byte. So we can't use that. So that gives us, again, seven bits to tell us what we want for our velocity. Velocity function gives us touch sensitivity in our, in our keyboard, in our device, or our controller. So the second data byte denotes how fast if I hit that key. So if I hit that key real fast, it'll be 127, the, the highest note, because it goes from zero to 127, 128 states. It's got to include zero. If I play it sort of softly, or just don't, it'll be a number lower than that. So again, I get touch sensitivity. I know what the note is. I know how hard I played it. So my complete message here is note on, MIDI channel one. The note is this G sharp one, and it's played at full blast. Now we don't know how long I played it. We don't know much more than that. That's all we know from this message, but we know a lot. Uh, when MIDI was designed, they also designed the note off message. They figured you have to have a note on message and then you have to have a note off message too. And then they realized, oh, that's kind of crazy. That means a lot of messages going on. What if we did it this way? What if we have the note on message happen and then after the note on message happens on a certain note, that note just stays on until when the person picks their finger up off the note, that then sends a note on message again at a velocity of zero. Hey. Nothing to it. So we, as a result of that, we don't really use note off messages. We use what we call running status. Anyways, a little fun fact for you there. I don't know if you'll ever need to know that, but you know it now. Okay, so moving on. What kind of MIDI messages are available? Now, we were looking at that earlier. We saw that we, um, in a, on one of our earlier slides that we had note on, we have note off. And then what was this about polyphonic pressure and channel pressure? 
Well, what those mean uh, basically is aftertouch. Some of you may have, be aware of a lot of, of controllers these days. If you place a chord, for instance, and then you push down hard on that, you can get that pushing down hard to do something else. So you, you, you got the touch sensitivity, you're playing it, but then push it a little harder. That can maybe introduce a wobble, that can introduce a little extra brightness, that can make things get louder, quieter, whatever. Do something. So aftertouch is something that we have two different kinds of MIDI messages for. One of them is the channel pressure, which means basically if I'm playing a chord, a three note chord, and I push hard on one of my notes, then whatever I've got the aftertouch set to do, like make things brighter or put a wobble on it, whatever, whatever it's set to do, it's going to do it to all the notes equally. So if I just push harder on one note, it'll make all the other notes do the same thing. With polyphonic pressure, however, each of the notes has its own pressure. So the polyphonic pressure message has one extra data byte, which has the note number. The channel just has the amount of aftertouch, which happens to everything. Polyphonics has each individual note. So that's what's kind of cool about that. Okay, program change MIDI messages. Obviously, what was one of the things that we can do? But we wanted to have it change sounds at a certain time. We could send a MIDI message to it that would make it switch the patch. Um, so we'd be playing one patch and then, or or have it have our sequence going. So it's playing one patch and then a verse, and then the chorus comes along and it switches to another another sound on that same channel and goes to another patch. Uh, so we can do control. We can do program change. We have 128 patches available. Get one data byte. We have a pitch bend message we can send. And the cool thing about the pitch bend that's really kind of cool is that we, when they were making pitch bend wheels, like on, on synthesizers, they realized that if they made it seven bits, it was 127 uh, little little increments when they went up on the pitch bend. You could hear it step up. Go bup, 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 bup. So they realized, well, let's tell you what, let's give it an, another byte, another seven bits. We have a total of 14 bits. So we have 16,384 states. So now we know everything between uh, all the notes when we're sort of doing our little pitch uh, bend. It's a smooth pitch bend. We don't hear it stepping because we have all these extra states involved. We have uh, 8,192 up, 8,192 down. So that makes a pitch bend happen in MIDI in a good way. A uh, control change. Now that's... Um, that's the one that sort of deals with all kinds of MIDI functions. In fact, any kind, every, everything from panning to volume to every kind of aspect of a MIDI note other than just the basic stuff we're looking at over here um, happens in control change. And so there's a lot going on with control change. I could spend an entire class on control change, but I'm putting up a control change number chart so you can see all the different control change functions that can be can be uh, assigned different values using uh, MIDI messages. So yeah, it's huge. It's, control change pretty much captures everything that's not on the rest of this list. And then the last thing of me kind of messages that we send are system messages. And system messages are global. So they're and they're so they're one 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 one. They start that way. Uh, so they don't have MIDI channels. So then the the, the the bits that we usually have for our MIDI channels, the following four bits in the status bytes, those now, we have 16 different kinds of system functions to talk about. Uh, two of them that are the, the main ones we want to talk about would be the system exclusive bulk dump and then the MIDI timing functions. But the bulk dump system exclusive, uh, that's when, for instance, if you have a Moog and you have patches for a Moog, um, that the patches for a Moog don't play on Oberheim or a Yamaha. They play only on a Moog. They're system exclusive. So you want to go ahead and put your Moog patches into your Moog. That's going to require a system exclusive setting where, and what that does is the message basically says, hey, we got this me system exclusive message coming. The first data byte says it's this brand. And there's a code for each company. It's like Yamaha has its own number. And then after that comes all the data. And then there's a stop message. So that's a system message that we deal with. So, but those are global messages. Anyways, I'm getting into probably too much detail about MIDI messages. I think you guys get the point. But what was really important was that we had to have the ability to, to record this like it was, like it's audio. So a standard MIDI file was created. We, had, we were able to create these, and this is .mid. And what this does is this 
uh, takes all your MIDI messages and timestamps them, puts timestamps on them. So it's like this MIDI message happens here in time and in relation to all these other MIDI messages. So it basically puts them all into a linear uh, sequence. And that's a, a MIDI file. And, and the beautiful thing about MIDI files is that they're very, very small. It's really easily stored, easily transmitted. In fact, that's why um, video games, basically, rather than having hours and hours of looped audio, they would have a MIDI sequence that would play a very, uh, a very, very simple two oscillator FM synthesizer. Um, and that way, could, these things could play for hours and. Um, so we have the standard MIDI file. This is very important, and this is we, we use these all the time when we are doing sequencing. The thing that's kind of great about MIDI files is that whereas before, when I first had my sequencer, I couldn't do any kind of real-time recording with a MIDI file. It was always going to quantize to something close to, uh, to, to the beat. But nowadays, for instance, with Pro Tools, has 960 pulses per quarter note. That means for every quarter note in Pro Tools, there are 960 subdivisions. So every time I'm hitting this, there's 960 subdivisions between each of those that you can place a MIDI note. So you can get really good resolution. It's not completely perfect, but that's still pretty darn good. Uh, so uh, you can do very, very human personal recording in MIDI before it even gets into an audio environment. And that's kind of where we're at now with MIDI, now that we've seen, we've gotten the MIDI 2.0. I'm gonna go ahead and put up all the MIDI 2.0 standards, and then you can sort of go through that if that's this is something that's interesting to you. But just to give you a really sort of short overview of what's sort of happening, I mean, it's been long overdue. MIDI, uh, we've been dealing with 1983 MIDI forever. It served as well, but obviously, once we started getting USB, Ethernet, and FireWire into the picture, and we could get bi-directionality instead of unidirectionality with MIDI, that changed the game a lot. And now that we can have a, a keyboard that goes USB into a VST on your DAW, and we're not even dealing anymore with, with real-world synthesizers and, and cables and DIN plugs or any of that stuff. We... No longer do we have this slowness of anything. Everything is, latency is not an issue really with MIDI anymore. So now what we got to deal with, number one thing about MIDI 2.0 is yes, it's backward compatible with MIDI 1.0. So everything that we can do with MIDI 2.0, will all of our MIDI 1.0 should still work with it, yes. Some things that are really cool, for instance, um, velocity, we were just talking about the note on message where we had the note number and the velocity. We had seven bits for velocity. Well, now we have 16 bits. So that means we have a lot better resolution. We don't have uh, 127 steps of velocity. We have, well, I'll do the math later, but it's a lot more with 16. We've upped the channel situation. Rather than having just 16 channels, now we have 16 virtual cables that have 16 channels each. This means we have 256 channels. I don't know about you, but I didn't really need that many, but some of these new guys doing EDM probably need all those channels. So, uh, but yeah. It's just blown right wide open. We have this new thing called MIDI CI, which means capability inquiry, which means when you plug your your controller into your MIDI uh, instrument, they talk to each other. The instrument says, hey, I can do this. And the controller goes, well, I can do this. And they kind of get copacetic. There's bi-directional communication. So that means a lot of cool things can happen. We can start doing really complex MIDI mapping. Uh, between your controller and your device and they can become very symbiotic. And for instance, we have this profile configuration. Uh, a good example is the Hammond dr organ thing, uh, modules. Drawbars are not like other um, instructions that we need from other things. So they're, they're sort of almost proprietary in a sense, but they're profiles that are that are also shared by other companies that are thinking, yeah, I want to do drawbar type things on my organ thing. So that would be a profile. Certain, uh, certain kinds of synthesizers have profiles. So you now have these different profiles that are available that um, your, your controller can communicate with your, your device and, sort of, and all of a sudden the, those sliders on your keyboard are the drawbar sliders and it just happens automatically. You don't have to sit there and assign them. Those are a lot of these kind of profiles are already available. Pretty cool. Um, also, this but the byte stream that we were doing, the serial unidirectional byte stream that we had, the 31... 0.25 kilobodes, that's no longer going to be happening. We have the universal MIDI packets. 
uh, that go much faster. Not sure how exactly how that works, but that's going to, we'll be hearing more about that. Also, there's these jitter reduction timestamps, which is kind of interesting. I guess all of, a lot of the MIDI messages are more accurately timestamped so that there's less jitter involved between um, timing devices, the timing between devices. That's where jitter happens. Uh, we have polyphonic pitch bend cop capabilities with instruments that have MIDI polyphonic expression, which is like these new rollies and these new instruments that have these much more serious capabilities of expressibility. It's also new architectures that are there to, to sort of support uh, future ideas. It's, it's, it's sort of meant to sort of be flexible with the, with the future. So hopefully that's the case. I certainly hope so. Anyways, MIDI, you know, we talked about the nuts and bolts and how it came to be and what is it and its raw element. So I want to gonna, I'm going to move here from this uh, video to uh, hands-on, how we work with MIDI in our DAW environment. So stand by. Be right with you. Be right back. Okay, what's going on? We're in Pro Tools and I've got a session up that I've made and we're just going to look up MIDI and Pro Tools for a minute. Now, I know most of you who play around with uh, Ableton and some of the other DAWs sort of don't care much for the, 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 the MIDI functionality of Pro Tools. And yes, it, it's, it's not the greatest and it can be kind of a drag sometimes, but it's, it's basic. It does work. It can be used uh, effectively. It's just not that intuitive and fun like some of the other ones, but it's a good place to learn how to do it. And so let me show you a couple things about MIDI. Just, and I'm, and I'm uh, apologize if some of you that have had more experience with this are sort of going, oh man, this is getting old. Uh, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm gonna sort of approach this from the standpoint of maybe you don't know anything about this and I'd rather sort of make sure you're all on the same page with this. So MIDI and Pro Tools. Uh, MIDI and Pro Tools, of course, is probably going to depend on a grid situation where you're going to have um, some kind of a grid to work with to to place notes. Um, I don't know if you're just going to, um, unless you're just going to turn on a MIDI track and jam uh, to freely into into space or whatever you want to do. You're probably going to need some sort of a click track or some kind of a grid kind of a scenario. So what I have here already is I've got um, I'm in grid mode in Pro Tools over here on upper upper left hand side. You can see it's a grid mode. I've set my grid here in the middle where you can see if I turn on and off the grid. Off, on, off, on. The grid is turned on. I've got it set to 16th notes, which is a pretty good sort of default setting for um, for most of a lot of times. That's the resolution for quantization we're usually operating at is eighth notes, 16th notes. Sometimes it's 30 second notes, but more often than not, 16s are our good starting point. So we're at 16s. Uh, I'm over here. I've got my transport here. And so if I want a tempo, uh, there's a couple ways I can get a tempo into this. If I already know the tempo, I can just go over here to my transport window and I can go and t click on the tempo and I can type in my number that I, of my tempo and put, hit enter and I'm good to go. If I don't know my tempo, I can sit and think about my tempo or play the music and think about it, highlight this number, tap the t, the t key on my keyboard, tap, 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 along with it. So I'm going to go tap, 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 tap. That's the tempo I want. And as I tap, it's going to change the tempo there and it's sped it up to 124. Let's just say 124 is what I like. So I'm going to, once I've sort of decided that note, I'm going to hit enter or return. I've got my conductors turned on, so the conductor is set up, so I've got my default 124 over here, so I'm good to go. I can do 124. That's my starting point. Um, I also have a click track that I put in, and how did I make a click track in Pro Tools? Uh, very simple to do that. You go up to the top here, and you bring down um, track, and you bring down, you go to create click track, it's right there, so it's nice. Click track is down here. Uh, I've got it muted. Let's turn it on. There it is. So I've got some kind of a, a time timekeeper ready to go. Um, so what have I got? I've got contact and battery here. I'm just going to put the contact on right now. I've got my MIDI track, my MIDI track on. Its output is going to the contact channel one. Good. 
mini channel one on the contact. As you can see, I've got 16 channels to choose from. Now, you, in case you were wondering why, why 16 channels in MIDI, now you know. There's four bits to tell us how many we get in our status byte of MIDI. So, all right, we've got, um, a co I've got a contact up here. So I basically just put a piano thing up here. I'll show you. The Grandeur. And it's got a very nice reverb on it. You probably have a piano thing on your Pro Tools. You can just pull up anytime you want to. All right, I'm in record on the MIDI track, sending it to the instrument track. And let me zoom in a bit because right now I'm looking at a big bunch of tune here. So let's zoom in so I can see bar one, bar two, bar three, bar four. Okay, I see four bars in front of me. Set the table here. All right, so I'm not a piano player. Let's say I'm I'm just a, a, I just go. I want to play some nice. I just want to have some nice chords. I want to have four chords, and I'm just going to you know build some stuff around that. Nice good old good old chords on the piano. So we have our MIDI track here. I'm going to get my pencil tool up here. I'm going to grab my pencil tool and I'm going to pop it on the MIDI track, which turns it into note mode. I can also do that going by going here, going back and forth between clips and notes. But I'm in note mode. I've got a pencil. Uh, oh, these are my notes over here. So let's say I just want to start with a nice C chord. There's a C. So if you get the note, if you put the note, place the note, you don't like it, you can just slide it down. You can slide the note anywhere you want. Hey. Anyways, put it in place. All right. There's that C chord. Boom, boom. So I can I just sort of penciled in the C chord, and if I play it, that's not much. Uh, when I when I when you pencil in these notes, just sort of pencil in these notes with a MIDI, it uh, it puts it at the default setting right at the middle of the road at 64, between zero and 127. Because as you may recall, for velocities we get between zero and 127 because we have seven bits in our MIDI message. So. If I look down here in my bottom left-hand corner that I'm circling furiously over here, I'm going to open that up, and that opens up my possibilities with MIDI messages, pitch bend, volume, mute, some of my, my, my control change messages I have. And you see this lollipop here, and each one of these notes has a lollipop. I can click on one, each one of these, I can adjust the lollipop note, so they're not all the... So I can change the velocity of each of these notes, some of them are louder or softer. Um, okay, so I've got these notes. Let's say that they're too freaking short. I want them to go the whole bar. So what I can do is I can use my hand tool over here and highlight all of them like by grabbing them like this, just sort of swooping over all of them. And then I go back over to my pencil tool and I go to the end of, this, end of the notes and I can drag them all out to the whole bar. So I got... No, oh, I got an extra note in there I didn't mean to get. Hey, is it, it's kind of cool, but I don't really want it. Let's get is it that one. All right, so I got... So I got a nice chord there. Let's say I wanted to do four chords. So let's do this. Let me use my highlight tool now. Highlight this whole beat. Command-C, copy. Put it here. Command-V, paste. Command-V, paste. Command V paste. But now let's change these chords up. I'm going to use my hand tool here. I'll grab these notes. And then I'm going to just go up to F. And I'm going to do the same thing with these guys. So we're going to go to G. So, and then this last chord, I'll go ahead and highlight those. And I'm going to grab those and take them up to. Now that's going to be an A major chord, unfortunately, so I think what I might do, though, is make that an A minor chord. So I'm going to take this middle note here and make it minor. So now I've got, let's hear these four chords together. All right, so let's say I want to loop that. And that's easy to very easy to do that in 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 MIDI. We can do that. Um, so what I'm going to do? Let me zoom out a little bit. Let me highlight these four bars or four. Yeah, they're four bars. And I'm going to switch these back over to clips. Okay, and I'm going to 
get rid of this last part of the clip here. So I've got this clips here and I'm going to go up here now to my draw bar here, right click on it and I get down to the loop function and I can now grab this just the right side of this and drag it and drag 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 and go as far as I want and loop as long as I want to for days boom yeah so now I got that forever and I can get rid of this click track now well actually you know what let's make a little quick little drum pattern to go with this so I'm gonna make a new let's say we've liked this we're happy with it we want to make a new drum a little drum pattern to go with it though so I'm gonna save that I'm gonna make a new MIDI track I'm gonna to go to track new MIDI creates. I'm going to go now assign this MIDI track to the battery. Channel one. Put it record. I've already got a little drum machine here. All right, let's have a little fun here and let's try to do a little drum track. Yeah. Put it in record. So I like that little pattern. Sounds kind of cool. Let's zoom in on that. I just, I just played that on the keyboard and we could have typed that in. I could have just gone ahead and used my typer, but I just thought this time I just, I, I had the keyboard already plugged in to the my USB and it recognized it. So the keyboard's there. And let's just get rid of this part of that. And... Okay, let's say I like that. Okay, but you know what? I didn't play it in very good time, really. I kind of, I mean, it was kind of okay, but let's say we want to lock it down. We want to quantize. So let's say we decide we dug that. We want to quantize it after the fact. How do we do that? Oh, I'm so glad you asked. Let's highlight this mess here. And let's go up here to event. Event operations. Quantize. And I do that and I get this window. And I can quantize my notes ons. I can quantize my note off so that the note off is comes off in perfect time. I can or preserve the note duration, which is what I want to do. I have a, the quantize grid. I can do it all kinds of crazy ways of quantizing. I've got cube all these different grooves from Cubase, Feel Injector, Logic, and MPC. So I can actually have this lock into these cool grooves that are already designed that just sort of have a weird internal different things happening that aren't just naturally so so I could do that uh, or I could just make it 16th notes which I'm gonna do that for now this is a drum track so I can I highlight that I pick 16th notes it's on there I've got these other options like swing strength I can have it so it doesn't do it a hundred percent I can just sort of have it be like 80% perfect I have it slightly swing. I have all these weird Frank Zappa things I can do. I can randomize it just a little bit so that just it's a little bit random each note or, or really random. We would highlight it and pick it and then apply. And then that would uh, that will fix it. If we want to be able to, if we just wanted to be playing our keyboard though and have it fix it as we're playing so I can just play it on the keyboard and it fixes it and I have to go do the quantize function, I can then switch over to a thing called input quantize. So as I'm playing the part, it fixes it for me as I'm playing it and input quantize. So this is this is a good tool to have. This is also in our event area, which, which is where a lot of cool stuff is. So event quantizes. This is how we can get quantized stuff. And if I like this, like I did the last one, I can do this again. I can go up here to and right click on this guy to loop on the right corner and just grab it and go. Boom. So now I've got this nice little track. I'll mute my click track 
and I've just sort of magicked up a little, little groovy track here. And what's kind of cool about this is that um, you, obviously we can, MIDI doesn't take hardly any space up. It's really, it's not like audio. It does, it's just almost like not even there. It's like megabyte, like kilobytes instead of megabytes. So um, it can, it's really easy to manipulate it. You can move the notes around. Once you've gotten the notes put in there, then you can just change the sound. I can have this piano sound turn into an organ sound. I can t I can change out all the drum sounds while it's playing. So so MIDI is just like the player piano that I had when I was, when I was, very young my grandfather had but let's say that we get to a point where we're really pretty happy about it and we like what we got um we've been we've been doing some looping we've been some copy and pasting uh we could do transposing i mean for instance i don't like this let's say i don't like this key i can take this whole track all the way to the end here and i can go to event event operations go to transpose and i can say hey i'm going to go to a different key i'm going to go uh up Five semitones. Up we go. And now we got this. So it's really great to do demos uh, with everything in MIDI because then if you have a singer that all of a sudden shows up and goes, I can't sing it in that. And you can just go, well, what, what can you sing it in? And you gotta go, I got this. And then you can transpose everything. And... Um, this gives you a lot of flexibility. You can change the tempo. If we decide we don't like this tempo, we can go faster, slower, by any increments we want. MIDI sort of gives us this opportunity to sort of operate um, in a magical area where we don't have to we don't have to commit to anything. But let's say we do want to commit. Let's, there's two levels of commitment, or three levels of commitment in Pro Tools that we want to talk about. The first one is called Freeze. Let's say we've got a lot of MIDI tracks, a lot of instrument tracks going, lots of instances of stuff. And we want to add more, uh, we, but we, we just want to hear those tracks. We don't necessarily want to commit them down to an audio track, but we want to hear all these instances. We still want to hear them. So there is a mode that we have in Pro Tools called Freeze, where we can take a track and we can sort of freeze it. If you notice over here in Contact and the battery, it's, it's on the instrument tracks. Freeze is on the instrument track you'll be doing. So what you want to do is you need to go to the instrument track. I want to freeze the contact track, whatever's going into the contact track. Let's freeze it. So I'm going to hit the freeze button here. And it does this. It does renders the contact. And now instead of playing that contact track, I've got kind of what looks like an audio rendering of it. And I'm going to hear that. That's my piano track now, but as you can see, my MIDI track has been grayed out that fed that contact track. And the contact track has what looks like sort of a semi grayed out audio track. That's not actually an audio track, but we can sort of treat it that way. We can't edit it, but we're gonna be able to hear it. And what's great is that we've just freed up the CPU is no longer playing the contact. So now we've freed up CPU space and we can now use that for something else you know for more excess so freeze what we can do with freeze and the way I did that again as I had I went to my contact and there was this little freeze guy and I can unfreeze him I'll unfreeze it and he's gone let's show let's do that again so I've got my MIDI track here is feeding let's, let's try it with the MIDI 2 here I'm going to freeze the battery this MIDI 2 is feeding the battery let's freeze the battery and again I get this rendering page boom now this MIDI track that was feeding the battery is grayed out, not playing, and the battery track has this funny looking gray track here. It was kind of like an audio track. So that's freeze. And again, I, I can sort of stay in freeze mode. The battery isn't playing, but you can see this is lit up. When I decide that I do want to commit this, or maybe I don't, maybe I can just keep it in freeze mode forever. If I do want to commit this, I have to take it back out of bat out of out of freeze mode. And then I'd have to go to commit. And what's commit? Okay, I'll show you commit. So let's say I want to commit this MIDI track here and the contact. Actually, let's put this next to each other. 
All right, so I'm gonna I'm gonna highlight these two. I'm gonna go up to track. I'm gonna go to commit. And commit tracks comes up with this. Consolidate the clips. I've got I can render the automation. I don't have any automation to, to render, but it pretty much copies all this stuff here. It does it offline. And I can actually make it so that once it does it, it hides and makes inactive the original track. So let's put that on that and let's see what happens when we do that. All right, once again, this is commit. So there's my contact. And as you can see, it took away my contact uh, instrument track. It took away my MIDI track and hid them, made them inactive, hid them, and then gave me this new contact committed track. And this is an audio track. So this is what we what I will generally do before I do a mix is once I've gotten to the point where I like everything I've got in MIDI land, I'm not going to run MIDI stuff. I'm not going to run sequencers to a mix. I want to have everything that's going to my mix audio. It's just, this is me. And I think that's a good practice um, because MIDI glitches happen in MIDI. They happen. So this is another way that we can then freeze and freeze and commit. And then of course there's bounce and we've learned bounce already. But this is some of the ways that we can sort of manage our MIDI information once we've recorded it. So what else can I tell you about MIDI? There's another cool thing I can tell you, which is about the MIDI editor. So let me go up here to the MIDI editor to the window. MIDI editor. And if I turn up the MIDI editor, what's kind of great about this, let me bring back my other MIDI here and make it active. I can bring this MIDI, uh, and let's make, let me reassign this MIDI here. Obviously, it needs reassigning. I'll just assign it to battery for fun. All right, so I've got my these two MIDI tracks. I can look at them together in the MIDI editor. And it superimposes all the MIDI tracks that you have lit up at any given time. So you give you a chance to sort of see what all the MIDI, uh, and if I have different colors for these MIDI tracks, it's, uh, as you can see, this is my drum track, this is my piano track. And I can sort of see if I need to like realign anything. So all the MIDI tracks end up in one MIDI editor window, which is super handy for stuff. Uh, if I have a lot of stuff and, I, and maybe some things sound a little bit out of whack, I can, I can figure out which guy's not riding with the others that are in a good way. I can, I can realign things, so that's good. That's the MIDI editor. Uh, while I'm at it, might as well mention about the, uh, well, we got a score editor. Once you've done this, it will also render it as a score. It's not as good as your other ones, but, you know, not too bad either. So, all right, MIDI. We've come, we've talked about a bunch of stuff. We've talked about how we can sort of put it in there, how we can work with it, uh, copy it, place it. I think that's about enough about MIDI for right now, and uh, you're probably MIDI'd out. So anyways, uh, more of making the mix to come. Talk to you soon. Thanks.